This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 56. Coming up on Space Time, some good news with confirmation that asteroid 2006 QV89 won't hit the Earth after all. First reports of what caused the explosion that destroyed a Crew Dragon 2 capsule at Cape Canaveral. And Russia launches the new Spectre RG X-ray telescope. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. We start today's show with a bit of good news. Astronomers have confirmed that asteroid 2006 QV89 will miss the Earth after all when it makes its next approach on September the 9th. Based on initial orbital data, it was feared that 20 to 50 meter wide space rock had about a 1 in 7,000 chance of impacting the Earth. But in the first known case of ruling out an asteroid impact through non-detection, ESA and the European Southern Observatory have concluded that QV89 is not on a collision course with Earth this year, and in fact the chances of any future impact is also extremely remote. Asteroids come and go, quite literally, and often, for astronomers, quite frustratingly as well. You can catch sight of a madly tumbling space rock, take some measurements to narrow down its orbit, and days later it's gone, potentially remaining unobservable for decades. Now, the general rule is, when an asteroid appears to have a chance of impacting the Earth, astronomers do all they can to take further observations and measurements of its orbit in order to narrow down exactly what its course is and what the chances of an Earth impact really are. These astrometric data refine science's understanding of the asteroid's path, improving understanding of the risk it poses and often excluding any chance of a collision altogether. However, the case of asteroid 2006 QV89 is peculiar. Now, as the name suggests, the object was discovered back in August 2006, then observed for just 10 days. And it was those initial observations which suggested that this chunk of space rock had a 1 in 7,000 chance of impacting Earth on the 9th of September 2019. So, that's just over a month away now. But the problem was, after day 10, the asteroid was unobservable, and it's not been seen since. Now, after more than a decade, scientists can only predict its position with very poor accuracy. So that means it's really difficult for astronomers to reobserve it, because no one's really sure of exactly where they should be pointing the telescope. Nevertheless, there is one way of obtaining the information needed. While astronomers don't know the asteroid's exact trajectory, they do know where it would appear in the sky if it really was on a collision course with the Earth. Therefore, astronomers simply observe this small area of the sky to check to see if the asteroid is indeed there. Hopefully, they don't see anything, and that's what's happened. So this way they can indirectly exclude any risk of impact, even though they haven't actually spotted the asteroid. And that's exactly what ESA and the European Southern Observatory did on July the 4th and 5th, as part of the ongoing collaboration between the two organisations to observe high-risk asteroids using the Very Large Telescope. The teams obtained very deep images of a small area of the sky where the asteroid would have been located if it was on a track to impact the Earth in September. And the good news is, nothing was seen. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. A recent planetary defence exercise designed to see whether Earth really could protect itself against a major asteroid impact didn't go so well, with scientists failing to save New York City from a major asteroid impact. Had it been real, a space rock would have slammed into the Big Apple with a thousand times the destructive force of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima to help end World War II. New Yorkers would have gone the way of non-avian dinosaurs 66 million years ago for exactly the same reason. The exercise was part of the National Near-Earth Object Preparedness Strategy and Action Plan developed by the White House. It was played out back in April during the 2019 Planetary Defense Conference in Maryland. This fictional NASA simulation presented a worst-case scenario showing what would happen if a giant space rock crashed into the planet. Now, according to the storyline, an asteroid somewhere between 140 and 260 meters wide was detected on an Earth-crossing trajectory. In this scenario, NASA gave some 200 scientists, engineers and emergency teams from the International Asteroid Warning Network the equivalent of eight years to track and determine the nature of the approaching threat and determine the best way to divert it. When first spotted, astronomers calculated this hypothetical asteroid had a 1 in 10 chance of hitting the Earth. 
In real life, the asteroid Bennu has a 1 in 2700 chance of impacting Earth on September the 25th, 2135. While at one stage, the asteroid Apophis looked like a probable Earth impactor in 2036, until better orbital data was obtained to rule it out. As the exercise continued to unfold, more detailed orbital calculations came in, allowing scientists to confirm that the asteroid was indeed on an Earth-impacting trajectory, with ground zero being Denver, Colorado. It was calculated that this mountain-sized space rock would hit with a force of 34,000 Hiroshima bombs, devastating a massive area of Colorado. Scientists with NASA, the European Space Agency, as well as scientists from the space agencies of Russia, Japan and China, decided the best deflection method would involve using six kinetic impactor rockets. These should hit the asteroid with enough force to divert it onto a new course, missing the planet. But not so much force that they'd simply break up the asteroid. So instead of having one big asteroid heading towards Earth, you'd have thousands of little ones resulting in the same amount of damage over a far greater area. As the simulation progressed, NASA threw in technical and construction issues as well as other problems delaying the launch of the impactor rockets. Launch windows came and went, and when they did finally fly, the impactors caused a massive 60-metre chunk of the asteroid to break off and continue heading towards the Earth on a new course. Calculations showed that this fictitious asteroid was now heading straight towards Manhattan. Travelling at some 70,000 kilometres per hour, the impact would kill more than 10 million people. With just six months to go before the hypothetical impact, mass evacuations became the only reasonable course left, and even that was choked by political indecision. The simulations allowed scientists, emergency service first responders and disaster relief organisations to identify key questions and issues, improve their interagency communications, work out what's really needed and what other teams will require when it does happen for real. And of course, that's the bottom line. It's not a case of if a big asteroid hits the Earth sometime in the future, but when. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley speaking with astronomer Dr. Fred Watson. A uh, fascinating story uh, from, strangely enough, NASA. Uh, And uh, it's about um, a simulation they've done to see what would happen to Earth if it was hit by a huge rock. Uh, Chelyabinsk is, is the most recent significant event that we've seen where people were, were injured, thankfully not killed, by the explosive effect. How big a rock were they playing with? Well, at the end of the day, it was, um, it was 60 metres, which is <clears throat> three times the size of the Chelyabinsk uh, object. And so you've got rather more than three times the destructive impact. So the story here, Andrew, is I think this is a very nice piece of work. So it was all about experts on how you might deflect us asteroids and what asteroids can do when they impact. And of course, many from NASA and many from the European Space Agency. And what they did was they kind of played war games in a sense with asteroids. Mm -hmm. They had five days of the conference and Essentially, the organizer simulated a developing situation over two fictional years. And what they did was they basically tweeted people with what the latest was. So you were sitting in this conference, presumably listening to many learned talks, while getting tweets saying uh, we're all doomed or (laughs) things to that effect. Of course, everybody knew that it was a simulation. And every article I've read about this is at pains to point out that this is a simulation because at the moment there is nothing we know about capable of hitting the Earth for at least 100 years. We kind of established that reasonably well. But, okay, what happens if we do find a near-Earth object and it looks as though it's threatening the Earth. So what they did was they simulated the discovery of an asteroid which they named 2009 PDC. Now, PDC, of course, Planetary Defence Conference, because it's not the normal way that you, you name asteroids. It would have letters and numbers if it was a conventional name, but it's fictional. So it's 2019 PDC. And the initial observations suggested that this thing would actually be a likely impactor in the year 2027, actually hitting somewhere near Denver, Colorado. And they estimate that this thing is 260 metres across. Now, that's big enough to do definitely statewide damage. You're talking about a huge disaster area. But they've realised that they've got eight years to do something about it. So they basically, they organised to send impactors to 
deflect the movement of the asteroid, which is what you do, what we would do if we found an asteroid that had, we had that long lead time, eight years is reasonably long time to do something about it. Mm. I think the simulation said they built and launched half a dozen spacecraft with what are called kinetic impactors. The, these are things that you really blast into the asteroid just to push it off course rather than blow it up or anything. So they did that. Apparently in the simulation, three of those missions were successful, not all six. But they had a kind of unexpected disaster in that while the main part of the asteroid was deflected uh, so that it wouldn't pose a threat, a 60 meter chunk broke off. And basically, uh, that was the one that they had to deal with because it was heading straight for the Earth in three years down the track. So uh -huh. 2022. Um, and then, you know, there were all kinds of, you know, you had to debate what you're going to do. There was talk of a, a nuclear weapon to take it out. That, of course, always gives you the risk that you just wind up with a whole lot of smaller stuff coming down in the same direction. In the scenario, they, um, I thought this was quite a nice touch. Apparently, Washington, the US government was crippled by political disagreements and so nothing happened <laughs> oh, um, that sounds but, very human <laughs> it does yeah but in the end it comes down to civil defense they've got this thing coming in at nearly 20 kilometers per second with a probably an airburst over an area something like 10 kilometers across you've got total devastation you know people would not survive it mm. so You've got the issue of trying to this. Oh, I forgot to mention it's aiming straight for New York, you know, just as a. Why a do they always pick on New York? Well, you know, it's kind of. Why don't they have a crack at Trundle or something? Well, Trundle's OK because there's only 90 people living. I know. Trundle, all out on a bus. You and know, they haven't got the Internet yet, so it's safe for <laughs> I can say. Oh, no, they have. They have got it. I, I, lo I like Trundle. I, don't, I, do I, think, too. I think you're not Trundle. It's a great place. Isn't Trundle where they've got the biggest, the widest main street in, in, in New Australia? South because you know, yeah, they used to do U-turns with bullocks, bullock yeah, exactly. That's why it's got. That's true. Um, and I used to go there as a kid. My my uncle was the bank manager there, so we went there for holidays. Um, well, I love Trundle. I think it's a great little town. I, I did just, a gig I there. I just like taking that. the Mickey out of places. You I mean, take the Mickey out. People of it. take the Mickey out of Dubbo all the time. So mm. you know, it's payback. <laughs> So why wasn't Dubbo a target for this simulation? Yeah, I don't know. It probably yeah, well, there you go. it's been a anyway, target for everything else for so long. Yes, that's right. So so the simulation says you, you're going to trash New York and you've yeah. got the problem of getting people out of the way. And I think that's where it kind of came to an end. Um, but what it highlighted was some real science technology, not science fiction, but real science, because there are two missions, um, and I think this is a collaboration between NASA and ESA, to send two spacecraft towards an asteroid, which is an interesting one because like several asteroids, it's a binary system. So you've got a big object and a small one mm. in orbit around one another. And what I think they're going to do is try and knock the small one out of its orbit or at least see whether you oh. can deflect it wow. to give it a try. So ESA's will launch, I think, next year. It might even be this year. NASA's will launch in two years' time. And the project is called DART, which stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test, and it's designed to see whether we can shift an asteroid. It's an, not an asteroid that has any threat to the Earth. It's perfectly innocent. By the time they finish with it, it might be. Uh, you hope that everybody will get their sums right, uh, but it's an ideal one, they say, for testing the technology, so moving the small component of, of this asteroid out of the way. That's Professor Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Investigators have blamed a leak of propellant due to the failure of a titanium check valve for the explosion which destroyed a Crew Dragon 2 capsule during tests at Cape Canaveral in April. The blast has delayed the start of manned missions to the International Space Station using new spacecraft launched from American soil until at least early next year. The Dragon capsule used for the ill-fated test was the same spacecraft which undertook the successful unmanned maiden test flight to the space station back in March. The test was designed to check the Crew Dragon 2 Super Draco launch aboard engines. It seems the faulty propulsion system check valve allowed nitrogen tetroxide oxidizer used by the spacecraft's eight Super Draco rocket engines together with hydrazine fuel to enter the helium pressurization system during ground processing. Helium's an inert gas. It's used to keep both fuel and oxidizer systems pressurized. 
The accident investigation team found evidence of burning within the valve recovered from the debris of the explosion. SpaceX's Hans Kronigsman says the finding surprising as titanium has been used on space vehicles around the world for decades. However, the Minerals, Metals and Materials Society says titanium has a notorious history for exploding, especially when heated to super hot temperatures, usually in the presence of water moisture. The titanium check valves have now been replaced on Crew Dragon 2 capsules with what are called burst disks, designed to seal off the flow path between the propellant tanks and the plumbing for the abort system's gaseous pressurization system. The problem is, burst disks are designed for single use only, while the check valves would have allowed repeated use of the engines. NASA have been relying on Russian Soyuz rockets to get their people to and from the orbiting outpost ever since the premature mothballing of the space shuttle fleet in 2011. SpaceX and Boeing have each been contracted by NASA to provide astronaut transfer services. SpaceX with their Crew Dragon 2 flying on a Falcon 9 rocket, and Boeing with their CST-100 Starliner aboard an Atlas V. NASA were hoping to fly their first crew aboard the Crew Dragon 2 on a test flight to the space station in August, with routine transfer duties then commencing before the end of the year. And while that is still possible, Koenigsman admits a lot would need to go right in the remaining months for that to still happen. We'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The Russian Federal Space Agency Roscosmos has successfully launched Moscow's new Spectre RG X-ray Space Telescope. A Russian Proton M rocket was used to carry the 2.7-ton orbiting observatory into space from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. The new observatory replaces the previous Spectre R telescope. It was launched back in 2011 to study cosmic expansion, black holes, neutron stars, and magnetic fields. However, Roscosmos lost contact with that observatory in January. The new Spectre RG, which has been jointly developed by Russia and Germany, will continue the work of the original Spectre R. It'll spend four years undertaking eight high-resolution all-sky surveys, the first to be undertaken in the medium X-ray band. It'll then spend a further three years studying selected galaxy clusters and active galactic nuclei. The Spectre RG spacecraft was built around a Russian Navigator satellite bus. Its primary instrument is the Erosita X-ray Telescope, built by the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Its secondary payload is the Russian Art XC High Energy X-ray Telescope, designed to detect supermassive black holes. It'll take some three months for Spectre to reach its final orbit at the Lagrangian L2 position, flying in a halo orbit about 1.5 million kilometres on the other side of the Earth from the Sun. From this nighttime position, Spectre RG is expected to uncover at least 3 million supermassive black holes and maybe 100,000 massive galactic clusters across the cosmic web. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Australian researchers have unveiled the structure of the influenza A virus genome, which they say could help improve development of vaccines and better predict new pandemic influenza strains. The influenza A virus stores its genetic information in single strands of material known as ribonucleic acid, or RNA. And until now, it's been difficult for scientists to completely understand its structure. Scientists used multiple genetic sequencing approaches to uncover the structure of the RNA inside the flu virus. They found the virus has evolved a degree of flexibility in its genome structure, which may help it escape the immune system of the host. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, suggest that further understanding of how these RNA segments interact will help guide vaccine design and help scientists better understand the potential risk of new pandemic influenza viruses. A new study has found autism spectrum disorder is mostly based on genetics rather than being influenced by external environmental factors. The findings reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association are based on 13 years' worth of population research from five countries. Scientists examined more than 2 million people, 22,000 of whom were diagnosed as being on the spectrum, in order to analyze potential autism risk factors like genetics, environment, and material effects. They found autism spectrum disorder seems to be about 80% owing to genetic influences, while shared environmental factors could only explain about 0.3% of the risk. The study confirms that autism is strongly inherited and far less due to environmental factors. So the next step of the research will be to dive deeper into the complicated genetics of autism spectrum disorder. 
The Southern Ocean is getting greener thanks to increasing amounts of tiny plants known as phytoplankton. The findings, reported in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, are based on 21 years of satellite data, tracking levels of chlorophyll, the chemical these tiny plants use to harvest energy from light. They found that waters in the subtropical Pacific, which includes the east coast of Australia and New Zealand, have had chlorophyll increases of 7%, while waters off the southern and western coasts of Australia, and that means the Great Southern Ocean as well as the Indian Ocean subtropical zone, have the highest increases of 28%. Researchers found changes to chlorophyll levels appear to be happening faster during the southern hemisphere winter, which suggests that the growing season for phytoplankton is getting longer. Android users are being warned not to download mobile apps from third-party app stores following reports of malware known as Agent Smith infecting 25 million Android devices globally. Android devices are being infected when the user installs an app, often a gaming app, from a third-party site which contains this malicious software. The Agent Smith malware then searches an infected device for other apps it can feed on, replacing them with malicious cloned versions without the user's knowledge. Agent Smith is capable of replicating apps like WhatsApp, web browser, Opera, and virtual keyboard SwiftKey. Through these replicated apps, Agent Smith then displays fake advertisements that are used by cyber criminals to steal your money or personal information. By impersonating existing apps on a user's device and leveraging the permissions a user's granted the real apps, cyber criminals can also hijack sensitive information like banking passwords and other online logins. If you think you may have downloaded an app containing Agent Smith, Android users can go into Settings, then click the Apps or Applications Manager, scroll down to the suspected app, and uninstall it. Now, if it can't be found, then you need to remove all recently installed apps. Physicists with the University of New South Wales have just built the first super-fast version of the central building block of a quantum computer. The team have achieved the first two-qubit gate between atom qubits in silicon, a major step forward in their quest to build an atom-scale quantum computer. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, marks a milestone result of a vision first outlined by scientists 20 years ago. A two-qubit gate is the central building block of any quantum computer, and this new version is the fastest that's ever been demonstrated in silicon, completing an operation in just 0.8 nanoseconds, some 200 times faster than any other existing spin-based two-qubit gates. Okay, I'm going to let you in on a secret. As a kid, I was a mad rev -head. I loved cars, and I still own some pretty exotic vehicles. And like any car-loving schoolboy, I also loved motor racing. And back in those days, the greatest racing drivers, the legends of the racetrack, were Alan Moffat and Peter Brock. Now, if you're not Australian and never heard of them, don't worry. Just think of them as down-under equivalents of A.J. Foyt and Jackie Stewart, back in the days when motor racing wasn't as global as it is now, and everybody pretty well kept to their own continent. Now, as every adult knows, not everything your childhood heroes do is necessarily smart. And Peter Brock was no exception. He became a huge fan of what he thought was the magical powers of crystals. He even began pushing this device called an energy polarizer. In reality, it was just a plastic box full of magnets and rocks embedded in epoxy resin, and he was selling the fans for over 500 bucks, claiming they would make your car go faster. Now, even as a kid, to me, that sounded pretty sus. Sort of like painting your car red to go faster, or putting racing air in the tires. Now, Brock, or Brocky as his fans called him, wasn't a con artist. He really believed his energy polarizer worked. But as Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics points out, the science was never really on his side. Yeah, it, this was sort of a, a bit sad, actually, because he was a hero to a lot of people. He was, he was an attractive personality. He won, won a lot of races, etc. He was a et nice guy, too. He really yeah, was. Yeah. I met him a couple of times. He was a, yeah, the, a, a charming man. Yeah, the, the problem was that he, he might have been with the wrong crowd. His wife... I understood at the time, yes, and we're right. talking mid-80s here, was, was yeah. a firm believer in New Age philosophies and things. He obviously got influenced by various people. He worked with people to develop what was called the polarizer, or the energy polarizer, which was in, supposed to improve the performance of your vehicle. You're basically strapped to the engine. Engine mount, I think it is. I'm not a car person. You'd know better than me. Uh, the wall between the front, the, the driver and the engine. Uh, you'd strap it there. Um, the and there are various... Yeah, the firewall. Thank you. There, there are various um, inventions which are supposed to do similar things. One is a 
magnet thing you strap around your fuel line and that's supposed to increase your fuel efficiency. This was supposed to increase the car's performance overall and it was supposed to be noticeable. I think of what sort of particular percentage it was. We actually got, getting a hold of them was expensive, but we did get a hold of one back in the 80s. The skeptics, we, we, we do this sort of thing because we're real party purpose. So we got a hold of one, you open it up and it's just full of junk. There's nothing that can really do anything on the inside. It's the same as the power balance wristbands with holograms in them. It's just all in the eye of the beholder. So we opened it up and found there's nothing there that would actually make any effect whatsoever. And some people did tests. Um, other motoring people did tests of the vehicles and can find no difference at all. Peter Brock, of course, instantly claimed conspiracies against it. He firmly believed that. He you know, really believes that he was selling a line of Holden with this thing supposedly attached. Holden's eventually said, either stop it or we'll withdraw your sponsorship. And he didn't stop it, so they withdrew sponsorship. He won our Ben Spoon Award, which is awarded to the most preposterous piece of piffle of the year in 86. And he really... It really hurt his uh, reputation and his, I, th I think, his professional career a lot, actually. So what was silly became quite sad, really, to see someone drag down. But again, he's not just your standard celebrity endorsing some ridiculous health claims when they know nothing about science. He was a, a driver who knew a lot about the technology. As you said, you met him. You could tell me more as to how, how much expertise he had in the technology of driving. Peter Brock, next to Alan Moffat, probably one of the greatest racing drivers in Australia. And you think if anyone could uh, test it, but again, it's constantly bias, as, uh, as we're talking about at other times, he would see an improvement because he believed there would be an improvement, whereas others who were driving cars with or without it, without knowing which one it was, could not find any difference at all, and that's the way the tests are supposed to be done. But Peter Brock firmly believed it, and um, he paid a price for it. And uh, sadly, of course, that uh, sometime later... Yeah. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast -coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 